Well, that sounds good. But let's suppose I have a tube, and the fluid's quiescent. I've got a long tube, and the fluid has no velocity. And I apply a pressure. A flow is generated. That flow will be a Poisson flow. That Poisson flow has vorticity. So how do these things reconcile themselves? I told you the governing equation for the velocity says that velocity can be changed by the presence of a pressure. The governing equation for vorticity says that vorticity can't be generated in a flow if there was no vorticity to start with. But then I just told you about an experiment where I have a flow with no vorticity to start with, and I apply a pressure, and then there's vorticity. So which part of this is wrong? Yeah. Yep. That's, that's exactly right, right. This vorticity is being created by the shear at the wall. Right? So the conclusions I've come to here are descriptions of the governing equation. They say that vorticity cannot be generated within the fluid, but it says nothing about the boundary condition. I can have an inlet boundary condition where flow is coming in, and if that flow that comes in has vorticity, well, then that introduces vorticity to the flow. Furthermore, if I apply a velocity, and then the no-slip condition is applied at the wall, there's a shear stress, and this leads to a rotation of the flow. So I apply a delta P here, or a gradient of P here. I generate a Poisson flow that looks like this. In fact, this fluid here, the no-slip condition, is holding up this flow, but it's allowing the flow that's farther from the wall to move. This leads to a general rotation of this flow in this direction. And in fact, this wall, because it's creating flow that's rotating in this direction, is creating vorticity pointed into the chalkboard. Similarly, this flow is being retarded here. That's causing this flow to have a rotational component in this direction. That's creating vorticity that's pointed out of the chalkboard. Right? So these conclusions, no omega is created in a flow if there is omega, if there is, oh boy, if there is no omega to start. This applies to the bulk fluid only. And if the flow is 2D, no omega is created in the flow. Again, this is bulk fluid only. <clears throat> and our key conclusion is that when we're comparing situations to the no vorticity state, that vorticity at some point has to have come from a boundary. Once vorticity is created from a boundary, it can diffuse, it can be convected, and in fact, that combined with a vortex stretching term can locally create vorticity. But that original vorticity had to come from boundary conditions. So now, let's consider an electroosmotic flow. And let's compare it to pressure driven flow. Well, let's compare it to pressure driven flow near a wall. If I apply a gradient of pressure, I generate a flow in a tube, for example. This would be a parabolic Poisson flow. Locally, this wall is enforcing the no-slip condition. The velocity at some distance from the wall is finite. So by definition here, there's always some du dy that is not equal to zero. This is not balanced out by an equivalent dvdx. So near this wall, there is always some amount of rotation. This rotation near the wall includes a, a vorticity component that's pointing into the chalkboard. So here I have vorticity, by definition, near this wall. If I instead apply an electric field, 
we have said that the velocity distribution that we get from that, I have asserted that this is exponential. I have not done the derivation, but we will do the derivation when we get to the description of the electrical double layer in chapter 9 of the text, or maybe 8. I've lost track. The no-slip condition still applies here. Vorticity is still being created at this wall. So the presence of this wall is taking this fluid, which but for the presence of the wall would have been just tumbling along at some uniform velocity, but it's putting the brakes on the stuff at the bottom. right? It's causing that to slow down, causing this flow to be faster at the top than it is on the bottom, leading to a net rotation of the flow. Vorticity is being created here, except now in this flow I have a non-uniform Coulomb force. And that non-uniform Coulomb force is saying, well, let's look at all the ions in this flow. If I have a negatively charged wall, I have a bunch of positive ions that are near this wall. And again, we will derive the detailed spatial distribution of these ions. But I have a bunch of positive ions near these wall. The concentration of these ions decays away as I get farther away from the wall. And that means that the Coulomb force that I feel here is really big right next to the wall because the ion distribution is high and it's a little bit less when I get away and it's even less as I get farther away. Right? So now I have a no-slip condition at this wall that's causing this fluid to tumble over. It's creating vorticity in this direction. But at the same time I have this distributed force that's pulling really, really hard on the fluid here less hard on the fluid here, less hard on the fluid here, and not at all up there. So I have a boundary that at the boundary is creating a whole bunch of vorticity pointing in to the chalkboard. But now I have a non-uniform body force that's pulling hard on the stuff on the bottom and not as hard on the stuff on the top with the net effect that this distribution of body force perfectly cancels out this vorticity that's being generated at the wall. So if I now look at a map of where the vorticity is in this flow, here I create vorticity at the wall and it diffuses out until I have vorticity everywhere. Here I have vorticity at the wall and it starts diffusing out but it's all cancelled by the time I get to the end of the electrical double layer. Once I get outside the electrical double layer the vorticity is zero. Also, outside the electrical double layer, the correct governing equation is the Navier-Stokes equations without a body force term. So outside the electrical double layer, I have this equation where omega is zero. So this term is zero, this term is zero, this term is zero. So d omega dt is zero. It starts out at zero, and it's always zero. Zero, zero, zero. Inside the electrical double layer, everything's hopping. Tons of vorticity at the wall getting cancelled out very quickly by this non-uniform body force term. So when I now look at this flow and I say, okay, where can I apply the potential flow equations? Well, as soon as I get outside the electrical double layer, this poten these potential flow equations can be an excellent description of this problem. Inside the electrical double layer, it's a hot mess, but it doesn't matter because this thing is so thin that I don't care. I can hardly measure it in the lab anyway. Comments? Questions? Thoughts? Angry declarations? Yes? So let me paraphrase your question and tell me if, if I'm on the right, the right track. One, one part of your question is, is the magnitude of the vorticity at the wall higher or lower in this flow relative to this flow? Right. So in, in, if, you, if you evaluate that, the vorticity will be higher here than it is there. And the reason for that is that the at the wall, the vorticity is basically just du dy over 2. 
and the, the magnitude of the gradients in the flow, uh, in the pressure driven flow, are low, and the gradients here are very high because the velocity is changing over a, uh, over a sh much shorter distance. So the magnitude of the vorticity at the wall here is really, really high. But as soon as I get out here, then that vorticity is zero. Yeah? So, okay, so your, your question is about the, the relative magnitude of the forces as a function of these velocities, right? So, I double the, if I double the voltage at the wall, at least in a, in a simple limit, I double this charge. I double the free stream velocity. So in that case, I double this, the free stream velocity is twice as high. The local vorticity being generated at the wall is twice as high, and, and the effect of this Coulomb force is also twice as high. 